Um, so welcome everyone. This is our second Latinx Heritage Month event for the Latino Alumni Association. Our first one was really fun um, book read and we're super excited that Cecilia is going to be here doing our second events with this are going to have a great, you know, vegan cooking class. And this is going to be to die for because my family makes Wojugisawa like every day. So like mm -hmm. to have like this version of it, it's going to definitely impact the way that we cook every day in my house. Um, so shout out again for your birthday. Everyone claps for Cecilia's birthday. I'll make everyone sing happy birthday, but I just don't trust the acoustics across everyone's Zooms. Um, I did want to shout out that we're going to be having our final event for our Latinx Heritage Month, which is going to be our homecoming celebration, which is going to be October 10th. Um, at 5 p.m. It's going to be a big event. We're going to have um, Kelvin perform with his band Grupo Aurora. We're going to have like um, our the Latinx uh, center director Marvin's going to speak and we're going to have games and we you never know what's going to happen. It's going to be a lot of fun. So everyone who's here, please um, come to that event as well. And don't want to take too much more time, but everyone welcome Cecilia Flores. She's an icon. She's a legend. She is the moment. Now, come on now. She just submitted her dissertation for her PhD in social policy like a week and a half ago. She just, she's, she's everything. She's a double <laughs> jumbo. And she's the founder of the Latino vegan kitchen Coco Verde, which was recently profiled in the New York Times. She's bumbling. She's busting. She's also, I forgot this one, and I forgot it in the bio, but I'll say it right now. She is El Mundo 30 under 30. Hello. Hello. <laughs> she has all of the laurels, the crowns. She's a queen. So I'm going to let her take us through. And also, she has two different camera angles. We're going to try to like spotlight both her speaking and also her cooking as well. So we're really out here with the technology bringing us all together. And I'm also super happy to see so many familiar faces and not so familiar faces. We're all, we're all family here. So I'll let you take it away, Cecilia. Sheesh, Andrew, I'm going to have to have you introduce me and, and just like say I'll nice do things. Instagram story <laughs> takeovers, you know? <laughs> Put my self-confidence like through the, through the roof. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to share this recipe with you all. Um, so as Andrew shared, we're going to be making chickpea guisado, which is based off of pollo guisado. So um, this company, for those that um, don't know, it was created really and inspired by my family's own transition into a plant-based lifestyle. And so I always say that we didn't want that transition to mean that we were also stepping away from our culture and our, our values. And because uh, let Latinx cultures across the board are pretty meat heavy, pretty cheese heavy. Like you think of some of those favorite dishes and a lot of them have meat and cheese and all those things. So we wanted to be able to reimagine them and think about them in a different way that was healthier, that was still accessible, that still looked um, similar. And so to uh, Amy was saying that, wow, I, th I think I have a lot of these ingredients in my pantry. That is purposeful. Like we really try to make um, these recipes easy for people to try and also familiar so it doesn't feel like too much of a, a leap in um, weird direction. Uh, so it's not, in a, we don't think that we're going to change and make everybody vegan in the whole world, but we do hope that, um, you know, seeing one or two dishes that you really love that are vegan, like maybe you'll be excited about including a vegan dish in your once a week or, you know, once a, uh, once a day or something like that. Um, so thank you again and welcome. I just, I also want to open up the space. If you all have questions, I love questions. I love um, trying to make things interactive. So feel free. Um, we were thinking about what, what might make the most sense. Um, and with this size of group, I think that it would be totally fine if you feel comfortable to just unmute yourself and say like, hey, what are you doing there? Or like, what's this or what's that? Um, or if you want to um, pop up in the chat then um, either way is, is totally fine. Um, so yeah, uh, any questions before I get started? And hopefully you all have the recipe. 
Awesome. And it's listed on our Instagram as well. I'll send a couple of um, recipe links there. Let me see if I can I'm gonna twist the camera a little bit so that I can be near our board. So hopefully, ooh, I already lost my ingredients. Okay, so we're gonna start off with the red onion. So we're gonna go ahead. One thing that you really are not gonna learn too much from me about is like knife skills. Ivanoi is the, the knife of this operation. He's the one that went to La Cordon Bleu and has these like very fancy, very amazing shopping skills. I am just very lucky that I've never sliced a finger off, <laughs> to be honest with you. But he's really good. It's very impressive to watch him, um, to watch him do it. So I am going to dice up some onions. Uh, I'm going to do one red onion. If you have white, you can do white as well, but I just prefer the flavor of the red onion. And so that's what I, I like to use in a lot of our cooking. Um, one thing that I did want to share was just thinking about um, fresh ingredients. One thing that's really important to me overall, and I think that it should be important to everybody in their own cooking is uh, being able to access fresh ingredients, which of course we need to continually have that conversation around um, not having access and all of that. But I think especially when we're doing simple recipes, it's really important um, if you can to use fresh ingredients because it really just highlights a lot of the flavors um, and a lot of uh, brings a lot more complexity to the dish. And so um, we've been experimenting a lot with use with growing our own food. And so we are very much novices, but that's something that um, has really continued to change our perspective around food and around um, our food systems. Because I think, does anybody, does anybody here have a garden or have like played around with gardens or anything like that? Let me change my view so I can see you. Can you raise your hand? Anybody? Yeah, gardens. So if you have ever, eaten anything from a garden from anybody else's garden or from your own garden I don't know if you've ever had that like really magical moment of just the flavor explosion like things taste so much better when you take them straight out of the dirt it's like amazing and I think having that experience has really pushed us to really think about how can we do things more sustainably how can we do things more locally which has pushed us to have our own garden and also we started composting this year which has been so exciting I really like composting um it's been really great I have a question Cecilia yeah absolutely I remember you have talked about saving veggie scraps for veggie stock yeah and I always feel nervous about like the outside of the onion like is it clean like do I really cook that off so could you like show from what you cut what you would save Absolutely. So these, I usually like what I call like the butts. These I will, I'll toss. And if it's particularly like sometimes I'll get something, um, what was something that I had the other day that was like very, I can't remember what it was, but I had something that was particularly like dirty and sandy. And so I decided to compost that instead of, um, I just couldn't wash it off. Um, I think it had just gotten, I was making, yeah, it was me when we were making pasteles en hoja and some of the root vegetables had kind of gotten onto the, the onions and the garlic and some of that stuff. So you're, the root vegetables you're not supposed to use um, in the stocks, like some are like yuca, yuca's the outside of it is you're not supposed to eat. And so um, we'll compost that, but for the most part, all of these skins, the garlic skins that we'll get into in a second, we love to use that. Garlic skins and these onion skins, like the butts we won't use. You can if you if you want to. There's nothing there. I wouldn't particularly advise against it, but um, we love to use that. We love to add in mushrooms and uh, celery, carrots pretty much any veggie and any of the remainder. So like the cilantro, um, whatever I don't use of the cilantro, like the stem, the bottom stems, I will also put that in the veggie stock. And for the veggie stock, if you've never used it, if you've never done it for yourself, 
I usually, most of the time I don't create enough um, scraps in one session to make a veggie stock. So I'll put it in a paper bag and then throw it in the freezer. And then when I accumulate enough of the veggie um, scraps, probably enough to fill a pot, that's when I will um, stick it in a pot and put enough water to cover it. And you can either boil it for about three hours or you can put it in, if you have an instant pot, which is what we're gonna use to cook today, then you can put it in the instant pot um, for about an hour and um, you'll get a really beautiful stock. Um, if you want, you can add salt and sometimes people will add a little bit of tomato paste for color, um, but really the veggies on their own, um, they're just delicious. If you, so we use veggie stock in this recipe and so you can feel free to buy some on your own. But again, it's one of those things that when you make it for yourself, when you make it in your house, the flavor is just so much better. I, I taste water, I taste veggie stock from the supermarket and I'm like, this tastes like a weird water. <laughs> it just doesn't have like a ton of flavor to it um, or a lot of them don't at least. And so it's um, a really great way to, re to reduce the amount of waste that you're doing and to um, incorporate some of those things into um, some, some more natural things into your uh, repertoire. That was a good question, so I mean, thank you. Other questions or other thoughts? Has anybody made their veggie stock before? Their veggie stock? Yeah, I recently started making my own. Yeah, it's fun. I have a lot of a friend that makes his own stocks in general. And, and I saved like, like too many veggie scraps and ended up having to stop saving them because I wasn't making stock often <laughs> enough. <laughs> Sometimes we'll look in our freezer and we'll see this like three different giant paper bags <laughs> with scraps in them and we're like oh my goodness we have so much but it goes pretty fast actually for us at least once we actually have it and just i like to smush the garlic a little bit i'm realizing how much how little leverage i have and then that will open it up i didn't bring my, my pilong over here does everybody know what a pilong is how do you say that in english I think it's yes. mortar and pestle, some like Mortar and pestle, I'm like smashy thing. <laughs> um, yeah, so the mortar, I didn't bring my mortar and pestle over here, but usually that's how I'll, I'll just smash it up. Um, so my mom does it, it just becomes like a sick, nice little, um, nice little pay. What was it? What do you call it? Because we call it a molcajete, I think. Oh, we're talking molcajete. About I think it's the same thing. Yeah, it's, we, we, Dominicans call it pilong. I think that Puerto Ricans also call it that too. Yeah, right? we call it pilong. Pilong. And it's just the, it's usually wooden. I have a, a stone one too that is, a, I have a molcajete. Um, it's a, a staple, I would say. I meant to ask how many of you all have um, instant pots? Do a lot of people have instant pots? I know. Yeah, quite a few. Awesome. It's one of those, I feel like a lot of um, kitchen tools can be kind of like, eh, like kind of useless or like, you know, you use it for just like one thing. So like, is it really worth it to spend the money? The instant pot is one of those things that like I really, really love um, and that I use a lot. It's just, um, really helpful, especially, um, like I know Goya was going through their, their whole thing and they got outed, speaking of people that got outed, Andrea, right? Um, uh, I think it's really important. I know a lot of people are making the shift away from Goya, but it's also important to, again, think about some of these fresher ingredients. So what we're gonna be using today, these chickpeas, I actually, you want to switch the camera back? Sorry to play tricks on you. These chickpeas are dried chickpeas that I pre um, pre cooked in the instant pot. And if especially if you're using beans, the dried beans are the way to go. They really completely change the flavor of a dish um, and can really again bring like so much so much more flavor that um, than just using the canned beans. But the canned beans are really convenient and I so I definitely have a lot of canned beans in my in my house too so no judgment there if you use canned beans all right the last thing that we're really going or the last two things I guess that we're really going to chop 
our tomatoes. And the, I'm just gonna slice up the olives too. That way when we, once we get to the Instant Pot, we'll be ready to go. Does, every, does anybody else prep and do everything before they cook or do you just like hope that you chop everything fast enough and get it into the plate, into the bowl? <laughs> I like to cut ahead of time and have everything like like if I'm on a cooking show, you know, like little bowls. Yes, yes I totally yeah. agree. I totally agree. No, I'm one I of those that's so like much. I was just gonna Go say that I'm the type of person that's like they're cooking and realize that oh it's going too fast. Let me bring it down to low real quick so that I can finish cutting my tomatoes or whatever. <laughs> yeah. I hear you. So I'm gonna leave. I like to leave some of them piecey. So I, I fine chop some of them, and then I leave some of them a little bit more chunky, just because I like to have the pieces in there. And if you don't have fresh tomatoes, one thing can that I really love um, are are tomatoes, canned diced tomatoes, particularly the fire roasted tomatoes. They're so good, and like of course you can do it yourself, but like to to have like fire roasted tomatoes on hand all t at all times I think is really challenging and so I um I love it because I feel like it adds like another dimension and more flavor to the dish um, So I'm gonna leave the tomatoes here, make a little room. And this is the last one. So these olives, I love olives. So my, my recipes are usually like pretty olive forward <laughs> when, I, when I have olives in it, but you can feel free to um, put less olives. My mom doesn't really like olives, so she puts less olives um, with I'm these things. Say, like, like whenever I've seen someone make this recipe, it's usually like maybe two or three olives. Yeah, I love olives. You're an olive, <laughs> definitely olive. Oh. And it's like 10 olives, yep. <laughs> I'm like, I want the olives. And these are big olives too, so I'm just going in. I also use, as it says in, in the recipe, but I like to use a little bit of the brine too because I feel like it gives it, again, a little bit more flavor. So, all right. I have a question about the olives. Yeah. Um, would you, would you recommend like only using green olives or I see those, are, I think that there's like stuff, they're stuffed olives or something, or would you ever just use like plain, like black olives? Like, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use black olives just because the flavor is different and the brine is a little bit different. Um, you could, you use it. Um, and I think that that would totally be fine. My preference is, is for the green olives, but I think that with the black, it would be fine. Um, I do love black olives, um, but I tend to like them a little bit more, the marinated ones. And I think in the can on the store, they come more, it's like more in water. Um, and these ones have like a nice little brine that bring, so the purpose of it is to bring a little bit of acidity to balance with the tomatoes and bring more acidity to the dish. And so you can feel free to add whatever you think. Um, so if you add black olives and it doesn't balance the acidity, you can feel free to add more tomatoes, a splash of vinegar, or something like that to balance the dish out. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool, thank you. Yeah, of course. We also have a comment eat. in the chat. They were talking mm -hmm. about how amazing your knife skill, your knife is so sharp. And they were asking if you had any tips on knife sharpening because Soraya says that her knife sharpener is kind of cheap, so that's probably not good. So this knife, this is even always knife. This is like a, um, it's a, one of those knives if you like slip, you'll slice <laughs> your finger. Um, very sharp. The, this is because this is like a higher end knife and it's more of like a, um, a tool. If he's going to sharpen it, he'll usually go and sharpen it. They have if you, at, the, at a store. If you bring it to like um, Williams-Sonoma or one of those stores, they'll sh sharpen it for you. 
Um, aside from that, I actually, I'm not in charge of sharpening the knives, even though someone that does that. Even though, how do you sharpen the knives? It's a Japanese one. You use like Japanese tongs? Yeah. Japanese stone. So I will, I will, even though maybe you can send me a link and I can share it in the chat. Yeah, um, a yeah. Japanese stone link to help sharpen um, your tools because it is I do feel like it is important it just makes things a lot easier and um, it's it, it can just make things go a lot um, faster than if you're uh, trying to work with a dull knife I, I know because most if it was up to me oh, we might to, we're still thing all right so I'm just going to take a moment to Reorganize. I'm going to move this cutting board and put the put the instant pot underneath, and that's what we're going to use to cook today. So all of these things, the tomato, the tomato butts. Um, so this is the Japanese stone that even uses to. Do you want to do a demo? How you sharpen the knife? Yeah. Um, so all those things, these are all going to go into the veggie stock. So the, all this, these, the tomato butts, all that stuff will go into the veggie stock. And then after that, it will go um, into the compost, which I think is, is also really cool. You can just do it right under here underneath this camera. So technically, you just want to keep like a 30 degrees, 45 degrees angle. I just go like side by side. And then you're just gonna feel the difference <laughs> on the knife. Someone said, go. I feel like okay. I see people do this in the movies and I thought it was always fake. <laughs> it does look yeah. fake in the movies. <laughs> but it's how. Yeah. And that's how it goes. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So let's go ahead and move. Oops. Let me not knock off anything over. Right. There we go. All right. Great. All right. So we'll see. Let me put the camera up a little bit because it's going to start to steam up. Okay. Can you bring me a little bit of, I forgot to get the vegetable oil. So we're going to start off with um, a little bit of, you can use vegetable oil, canola oil if you want, um, grapeseed oils, grapes, grapeseed oil is one of my favorite um, oils to use cooking because it's a little bit healthier. I mean, oil is oil, but it's a little bit healthier and um, it's really good at withstanding higher heat. And so olive oil, I know that a lot of people use it because it can be a little bit healthier, but olive oil really shouldn't be used um, at, on high heat because it's, um, it's not good for the oil, the way that it degrades. But grapeseed oil is really great for some of those higher heat moments that you need. So just gonna wait for the oil to heat up a little bit in the pan. Starting to sizzle. So again, I know a couple of you said that you have Instant Pots. I love the Instant Pot because it has so many functions. So you can pressure cook, which is one of the things that we're gonna do today. I pressure cooked the chickpeas, the dry chickpeas, which is um, how I got, I got them really soft, really fast. If you don't have a pressure cooker and you still wanna use fresh beans, of course you can soak them overnight. I just, I always forget. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, I wanna make this thing and I, don't, I want it now and not the next day, so you know. So I, but I like to use the Instant Pot for that. And so I'll usually put it in with some water. I season the water a little bit. I'll probably throw some bay leaves in there, some salt and pepper, um, and then um, cook it for 20 minutes in the Instant Pot to, to open up the beans and get them ready for the dish. So here we have it on saute mode and we are going to, you know what I also, oh, I have this code here. I'm gonna say I forgot cooking utensil. So we're actually gonna start off by frying a little bit of sugar in the oil. So we're gonna use like about a tablespoon of sugar. And then I can use the Instant Pot to soften dried beans when I cook cooking this already. It's a revelation. It, it's, it's really a life changer. It really, really is. All right, so this, 
but I wasn't as hot as I thought it was going to be. I mean, this oil. I'm gonna let it come up a little bit. Oh, thank you. That's what I was really wanting. Okay. So we're gonna let that come up a little bit and then we're going to add in the onion. So we'll just give it a minute. Okay, now it's starting to heat up. So we just wanna caramelize the sugar a little bit. So, and we just want it to like, to get it to dissolve. So that's really what we're gonna look for. We don't wanna like burn it or anything. It's to, again, so I know, so Adney, it was you, right, that um, mentioned salmon, no threat, is that how you pronounce your name? But you, you were talking about salmon. But yeah, were you talking about salt, salt, fat, acid, heat in the chat? Yeah, no, she has a, well, yes, and she has a podcast called Home Cooking that she started after quarantine where people leave them voice notes being like, I bought too many carrots at the store, what do I do? Or like, I have all these chick canned chickpeas in my cabinet what do I do and then she gives them advice and she's so kind of gentle and fun about it yes I think that she's so great I fell in love with her after watching salt fat acid heat which was her Netflix series and like talking kind of going around and it really she really talks about how the balance between salt fat acid heat really is what perfects plates and so um I love that she's doing the home cooking I'm gonna have to check that out I didn't know that um but for here in this dish the sugar brings some of some balance to the dish so it brings like some of the sweetness and it's going to balance out um some of the acidity in the dish and so that's why we um fry it up a little bit oh you're taking the same story <laughs> I didn't realize that that's awesome we're in the same page all right so now you can see that the sugar has started to dissolve. This is good. So we're gonna go ahead and add in the onions. Okay. So we're going to leave them there for a few minutes, stirring um, occasionally so that they don't stick. Um, but we definitely, we want them to be really nice and soft and um, start to become a little bit more translucent. With the yellow and the white onions, obviously you can tell when they're really well cooked because they really do become translucent. But you want the red onions to lose a little bit of that color and to really start to just um, soften before we add in some of the other ingredients. Ooh, that's awesome. So I need to share it in the chat um the, in the home cooking show the first episode she talks about great tips for cooking beans so definitely check that out she's great i really i just love her she is so so amazing wait to the end okay other cooking tools that are my favorites that is a good question i feel like i'm a bad person to ask this question to because i have so many and i love them all I feel like my other, I would say my other two, I love my, um, uh, oh my God, now I blanked on the name. I love my my uh, dehydrator the and an air fryer. So it's an air fryer, but it also has a dehydrate mode and it can also bake things and it can also do all these other things. So I think that is really cool for me because um, first my kid is addicted to french fries. I have passed on a love of that to her. So it makes me feel a little bit better when I can do the french fries in the air fryer versus deep frying them in oil, <laughs> but you can fry anything in there. So it makes it just everything like a lot healthy. Yvonne does have good taste. Um, uh, makes it a lot healthier. makes it, um, it's also really fast. You don't have to wait for the oil to heat up. So I really like that about it. And also recently we've gotten into with the, um, with our own, pl own planting and all of that, we've gotten into, growing our own flowers to make tea. So I'll dehydrate things in there too. I'll dehydrate mushrooms and make powders. Um, the, some of the herbs in my gardens, we made our own um, powdered uh, parsley and cilantro and all of that, some of these dried herbs. So that I, that I really like. And then the other thing that I really love, so um, 
the Lodge brand of, uh, oh my God, now I'm blanking on the name of uh, cast iron pans and pot, pots and pans. So I have two now, a cast iron pot and a cast iron pan. And I just love them because I feel like they cook everything really well. Everything heats really evenly. So it's really nice to make um, sauces in and to just generally cook in. And uh, in quarantine, one of my quarantine uh, hobbies has been making sourdough bread. If, if you follow us on Instagram, you know I've been making a lot of bread. So the cast iron pot is like, re it's just really great for, um, for baking and, and you can put it, because you can put it in the oven, you can put it on the stove, it heats really nicely. So those are some of my favorite tools that are just a little bit extra. But honestly, to keep it basic, I feel like really, you just need a, a good knife, a knife that you really like, that you feel comfortable with. Um, and then just, you know, a little bit of hunger for exploration. Um, no pun intended, but I think that that really, you don't really need too much. Uh, you can do a lot with, um, with a little. I don't think you need anything crazy. All right, so now, now that the onions are nice and they have a really nice color to them, I'm gonna add in the garlic. The garlic cooks up really quickly, so I'm just gonna add it in and cook it up for about 30 seconds. Just get it nice and fragrant. Onion and garlic sizzling in a pan is like one of my favorite smells ever because I feel like it really is, it's the basis of a lot of cooking, especially a lot of Latinx cooking. We use a lot of, um, a lot of onions, a lot of garlic. And so I feel like it's just such a kind of welcoming um, aroma because it can just be so many different things. Mm -hmm. Right? It just reminds me of my childhood. So now that the garlic is nice and tender, we're gonna go ahead and add in. I like to fry up everything a little bit before I add in the um, the sauces. So this is these are the chickpeas. So these chickpeas. This was a a cup of chickpeas. Um, that I saw the cup of dried chickpeas that I softened. So if you were going to just use the canned ones, I would use two of the like 15 ounce cans, drained and rinsed, as, 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 as it says in the recipe. I would use that in here. And then let me add in, oh, here they are. I was like, where did my other ingredients go? I put them next to me. All right, now we're gonna toss in the tomatoes that we chopped up, as well as the olives. So you can start to see it's coming together. Okay. I like to just give it some time to cook together and just kind of um, have a moment together before I add in the um, the liquid ingredients. So I'll leave it there. And then we're gonna add in two cups of vegetable broth and the tomato sauce. And then I have a little bit of brine in here. So I'll we'll add in the tomato sauce. Add in the veggie stones. And then it's really to taste, which again, I, one time I had this friend that was also a chef and he said, well, if I had a cookbook, I would just have a list of ingredients and write to taste after every one of them. And like, he was being kind of a jerk in that moment, but, um, it kind of, but the sentiment is true in the sense that everybody has different tastes. And so I always like to welcome people to just play around. Cooking is a lot easier than baking in the sense that you can play around, you can add different quantities of ingredients. And usually you can, if something goes awry, you can usually figure your way around it. 
baking is much more chemistry and even I get nervous to switch up recipes because it can just completely um, ruin a dish if you do things incorrectly. But all of that to say, um, a little bit of olive brine to taste. So I would say there are probably two tablespoons in there because um, I like it a little bit. Um, I like it to be nice and um, the flavor to be nice and strong. So here we go. So we're going to go ahead and I have my lights here. We can chat and check in a little bit. I'm going at while I. Oops. Can you grab me a towel? Okay. You wanna? Can you grab me a towel, please? Hold a little more water on my computer. It's not disastrous, but <laughs> but it made me nervous. Uh, a towel. So I'm going to pressure cook the uh, all of this for nine minutes thank you one of the tricks with the instant pot if you have one or if you plan on getting one is that when i first got it i was like oh man this doesn't even really do what it says that it's going to do because you go into it with this assumption that everything is going to cook really fast but the water needs to heat up before it can really create a pressure seal so one of the things that i like to do when i'm cooking is if i'm using water in the dish i only use like really hot water um, and before I put the lid on, I like to let it come to a boil first and then go from there. So that helps with the timing because otherwise it can take like an extra 10 minutes for things to heat up and then create the pressure seal and all of that. But it usually does it pretty quickly um, when you use hot liquids instead of um, cold or cool liquids. So two questions from the chat. Yeah. What kind of olives do you use and do you use capers too? Good question. So the olives that I use, those ones are green olives. They're Spanish olives with the um, pimento inside of it. You can use regular green olives. There was a question earlier about whether you could use black olives or not. I haven't used them. My experience, the black olives aren't as, they don't have us the same brine and the same kind of tanginess to them that um, the green olives do. And so, and the olives are there to kind of bring a balance to the dish and um, balance the salty and the sweet and all of that. Um, and so I, you could give it a try. Um, but those are the, the olives that I prefer are the, um, the green Spanish olives with the um, pimento in the middle, like the, the, the little pepper in there. And the capers, I don't use capers as much because I find that they have a different flavor to them. Um, and I, so I personally prefer the olives. I use capers a lot in dressings. I love capers in dressings, like the Caesar salad um, dressing has capers in it and the um, Greek salad dressing also has capers in it, I, I believe. Um, so I use them much more for dressings than I do for um, for cooking some of these dishes, but I think you could totally sub them in and, and, and that could be great. Um, I saw the other question was, is it hard getting your family to adopt a more plant-based diet? It was really hard in the beginning. It was like, you would have thought that I like announced that. <laughs> I was like that, that something dr like drastic and scary was happening and like there was a very um dramatic responses a lot of people thinking like oh my god like what do you mean and like are, how can you even live like not eating meat and um it was very it was a shock um to a lot of people um especially in the beginning even to even he came home one night it was like midnight and he came home and I had watched uh what was the movie what the health that documentary that everyone always says, like I had watched What the Health, and even I came home and I had just watched it, he came home at midnight, and he was like, hey, how was it? Like just so, it was just so foreign to him, um, and to everyone really, and to, even to myself. And so I think that the beginning was very challenging because I feel like we're very, um, just taught and what we see around us is that meat kind of goes in everything, cheese kind of goes in everything. And so that is our per perception. Um, when in reality, today, in, in today's times, we eat a lot more meat than, than ever. So we, we didn't used to, like ancestrally, we, we used to eat less meat, but because um, we've been able to drop the prices and, the, and bring the demand up, that's kind of changed how we eat. Um, and also, 
there are like there there are quite a few dishes that are just happen to be vegan like tipile is um a dish that is like very um it's just so integrated in my family it's a, such a it's a dominican tabbouleh basically it comes from um that my that immigration of middle eastern folks into the dominican republic um and that is like such a staple in our a lot of our parties and that's vegan and so i think it was really being able to say things like that and also once people started trying our food and and seeing like what it actually tasted like um they were like oh okay like i really like this oh that tastes good like you know and so i think that really i don't like to trick people but a lot of times i'll just like put something out there and be like maybe maybe you want to try this and they'll and they'll eat it without that kind of judgment on it and be like oh this is really good i really like this i'm like yeah it's vegan so there you go <laughs> i have a question um yeah. so nine minutes sounds like crazy fast like cook anything mm -hmm. like not typical for my family i'm just wondering if you cook it on the stove mm -hmm. Um, is it just as quick just because it's vegetables or like do you need to cook it for a little bit longer like how does that work with depending on where you're cooking it just in case you great don't have question. Any it's a great question so I would say I would put it on low for like 30 minutes which is still quick for a guisado um, but because with the meat you really want it to be like really nice and tender and really kind of like falling off the bone that takes a lot longer versus with the vegetables you really want them to come together and to just like to be together and to like and soak up the flavor and all that stuff. And so it takes a lot less time for the vegetables versus the um, versus meat, but it still does take um, quite a bit longer on the stove versus in the Instant Pot. That's a good question. I'm also, a, oh, go. I have a chickpea logistics question. <laughs> in the can, you know, they have the extra little skin. And the yes. first couple of times I made them, I was like, this is annoying and I would take them all off, but I didn't, I don't know if I'm supposed to do that, first of all. And if you, soak them from dry, do they also have that little skin? And do you take it off? Great question. You don't have to take off the little skin. Um, so I know that that's like really tedious. If you're making hummus, the traditional way is to remove the skins um, and because it makes it like nice and creamy. So that's the only time that I would really say like, maybe if, if you like a nice creamy hummus, then go through the effort of taking off the, the skins. But if you're taking them from the can, you can just, you can rinse them. Um, and I don't even dry them all the way, but I'll kind of just toss them in the colander a little bit to get rid of the excess water, and then I'll toss them in. Um, and with the dry chickpeas, I don't notice the skin issue really at all. There's, there's not that same kind of skin that develops. I, I always wonder if it's because it's sitting in the brine, the chickpeas are sitting in the brine in the can, and maybe that is kind of what contributes to it, or, but I don't notice like that same issue with, um, with the dry chickpeas. That's a good question. I'm sorry you put in that work. I also wanted to jump in and say that I, I forgot to mention this at the beginning that like these guisados like pollo guisado or garbanzos guisado these are like the very quintessential like Dominican meal like this is literally like what my grandfather's cooking upstairs right now like it's when you hear like arroz con pollo like that is like the pollo that they're making is like pollo guisado typically at least for Dominicans I can only speak for like my community but um so like what we're what she's making here the vegan version is like very much like a very daily meal that anyone would make after they come home from work thank you thank you for for lifting that up and i think that it's really that was really what was important to us like just to echo what i was saying before is to really i wanted ivana my daughter to be just as rooted in dominican culture as i was growing up so i didn't want it to be like all her childhood was going to be I don't even know, like something else um, and not ha not enable her to engage with those things um, that I did. And so that's why it was really important to us to to play around and make vegan patalitos and make vegan arroz con pollo and make, you know, make all this stuff um, to be able to offer options for her and now for, for other people, which I think is really, really great. I also forgot to mention that I, so I put the oregano in the, I like to put it in the brine um, before I add it in to kind of disperse it a little bit better. So I didn't, but I didn't actually say that. So the, I put a little bit of the oregano and salt and pepper to taste in there and then added it in. Um, but again, uh, an open invitation to just to play around and to um, season, season things as you like, add more oregano, add less oregano add more salt or less or less salt or however it is. I know 
Like for example, if I'm cooking for my cousin, my cousin has high blood pressure and I use significantly less salt for her because I know that her palate, because she's so used to eating a lower sodium diet, I, she, if I cook something for her to my taste, it will be very salty. Um, so just an open invitation to, to play around and see what works, works best for you and for, for your taste. That is, I mean, I love that. That's a great idea, Amanda. The pollo y salad with the spaghetti in it. Amazing. It was just, it's the only way I know how to make spaghetti. It's like you make the guisa and then you just boil the spaghetti and then you like add like tomato sauce or paste as you wish, but that's like the foundation. And then we ate meatballs with white rice. So we did things all kind of yes. our way. I was going to say backwards and then I caught myself. I was like, well, nope, we did it our way. Our uh, way, love it. But question for you. So I am trying to eat more plant-based because the way my inflammation is set up, um, but it's hard. I'm like, what is my gateway? What's my starter thing? So if you had to say like, what are some starter dishes, starter ingredients to have in your pantry? What would be your recommendation? That is a great question. It's one of my favorite questions. So things I always have in my pantry. So those, the, the um, fire roasted tomatoes in a can that I was saying, I almost always have those in my pantry because it's like such a great way to make soups to you can and just and bring like a lot of flavor to things. I almost always have that in my pantry. Um, I love to have like a lot of beans. Um, I eat a lot of chickpeas, a lot of black beans, a lot of any kind of bean. That's like really one of my main protein sources. Um, you know, in pound for pound, it has more black beans have more protein than um, beef does. Um, so that is it, and less, you know, significantly less sodium, significantly less fat, um, all that stuff. And so it's a great way to bring in some of those nutrients while also um, bringing up your your protein. Um, I love to have um, freezer brown rice. So like when I'm in a pinch, like because that's so a lot of these staples are like time effective because it's usually because I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to eat, like whatever it is. So Trader Joe's in particular, but you can find it anywhere. Trader Joe's has really great brown rice in a bag that you can just kind of pop in the mic in the microwave and then it's done in, in a minute. Um, and then you can kind of put, put your stuff together and you have like a really great meal in just a few minutes. Um, so a lot of those things are kind of my staples. I love to have like a sofrito in the fridge as well um, or in the freezer. Sorry, can you just for the group say what sofrito is just in case they don't know? Yeah, of course. So sofrito is also kind of like a basis of um, Caribbean cooking, I feel like. We, um, definitely Dominican and Puerto Rican, I feel like Cuban as well. Um, but other folks chime in if, if sofrito is, is part of your Latinx um, heritage. But basically, it's I'll take a, um, a bundle of cilantro, a bundle of parsley, um, a couple of small red onions, um, a bunch of garlic, like a little head of garlic, um, what am I missing? The Cuban L pepper or a regular um, a bell pepper and I'll blend it together. I'm sure I'm missing something, but I think that that's pretty, I think that's pretty much it. Um, and I'll blend it together and that all those flavors together that it just makes like a really nice base for things. And so it, it just um, makes everything so much quicker. So you can just kind of throw that in the pot and then you're cooking and then you're going. Um, and again, with the vegetables, everything cooks a lot faster. So with the sofrito, I'll, we have a container of it in our fridge right now, um, but also if I want to just prolong it, you you can get an ice cube tray and put the mixture in the ice cube tray, and then you have like nice, easy, quick seasoning that you can just pop into things, um, and it's ready to go. Um, but yeah, I saw you said sofrito is life. It really is life. It just it's so good, and it's just such a um, so integral to a lot of our our cooking, for sure. And it's been a lot for us, um, again, going back to kind of like the flavors and all of that, like it's been, we've been, we had already been moving away from Goya for a while and using adobo and the powder and all of that to really just um, go back to what our grandmothers knew, to what our great grandmothers were cooking instead of um, the process, a lot of the process stuff that we're engaging with now. Um, and that the sofrito, it really is just, it elevates the dish. It, like it really makes it what it is. Um, and it's, it's a nice way to to get around some of that process stuff if, if that's what you're interested in like some of the sopitas and stuff like do your do you do the sopitas if you want to like i am not judging um but that is something that we've just really appreciated lately especially 
Um, bye, Sadens. I don't know if you popped out already, but awesome. So this is still cooking. It has a couple more minutes left. Any other you, questions? Oh, I know that we're right at six o'clock too, so I know that folks probably have to go. Do you have any very memorable Tufts meals? Very memorable Tufts meals. Or do you want to get in on the Carmichael versus DeWick debate right here? Like DeWick, you know, do you all day, every day, first of all. <laughs> DeWick all day, every day. My favorite, obviously non-vegan, but um, I made a vegan version of what was it called? The ultimate grilled cheese or the big cheese or like whatever, well, that, that grilled cheese in, in um, From the commons. Yes, yes. What was that cheese? They had the pesto and the yes. like million different cheeses. Oh, yes. So good. So good. <laughs> I ate so many of those. I like, I probably ate my weight in whatever it was, the big cheese was. That oh my God. Called? So much dairy, but oh my God. <laughs> so good. So good. So but yeah, we made the, the a vegan version of it using some cheese that we bought in some of the cheeses. We've been playing around with making our own vegan cheese, which has been um, exciting and interesting, definitely challenging. I would say that that is when people are like, what's the hardest part? I think it's letting go of cheese. Um, so now I don't really miss cheese, but when I want to, when I want to add something cheesy to a dish, it's been interesting too. Um, to find ways to, to create that and to add that in for sure. Awesome. Yay. Yes. What was the moment that you went transition from eating, you know, meats to going vegan? Like, so for me, I always say that people should take their own process and journey. My best friend, always says like every meal counts like you know you don't don't stress about if you're deciding to go into a plant-based direction don't be like oh my god I need to make everything and blah 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 and you know kind of going um driving yourself a little bit crazy about that I think little steps are like totally fine for us it really was more of like a cold turkey kind of like a what a poor expression talking about veganism <laughs> there was kind of like a um you know we just kind of took the plunge right away and um for us it was really so it was Ivana Ivana was a big turning point really thinking about it was really when she was coming up on her six months and we were going to start introducing solid foods and it was really a moment of time where I was like well what am I eating what it, what's in my diet what do I want to impart onto her um and that was a moment also that I had the time and the space to engage with some of the resources. My cousin had already been vegan for a long time. Um, one of my best friends is vegan also. And so it was um, a moment for me to be able to also engage with um, some of the resources that they had shared with me. And so once I did, I was like, all right, we're doing this, we're going vegan. And um, it was great. And so I, I think I actually also forgot to say this to you, Amanda. One, one thing that also it's great for me is get finding recipes that I was really excited about in the beginning. Like that was really great finding like three recipes that were going to be like that I could flip around for lunch and dinner and all that stuff and be kind of customizable. That really helped a lot because then it was like, Oh, I get to eat this or, Oh, I get to eat that. Or, Oh, like this is really cool or whatever it is. And that made it really exciting and a lot easier. Um, and it also just opened the door to me. Like I eat so many different fruits and vegetables now than I did before because it just has open things like people often talk about vegan diets as limiting but in my opinion and experience it's really been eye opening and um palate opening to you know i eat so many more different nuts i eat so many more different like even squashes and like all these different things and so um i think that was really helpful that mindset of switch of like i don't oh i can't eat this to like oh all the things i get to eat and also um you know just uh, having that support. It was helpful to have Ivanoi be very supportive. He was, uh, I had shared that story that he was very doubtful in the beginning. But once I made that first uh, dish, the first experiment that I found on from Pinterest, he was like, oh, this is really good. <laughs> I like this. Let's do more of this. So, yeah. Did you grow up eating a lot of vegetables? Because I feel like in my family, we did not grow up eating vegetables. Or like, mm -hmm. I remember but one of my roommates in college was like the first person to like teach me how to cook broccoli and like I went home and I was like oh like ma can you make me broccoli she's like well I don't even have chicken broth and I was just like why would you need chicken broth to cook broccoli like, that's not how you... what I'm confused like, what are you using my chicken broth for right. 
<laughs> I totally agree. I we really didn't look. We would have like a salad every once in a while, like in a like in the very Dominican salad with like iceberg lettuce, you know, and like a tomato and like maybe a cucumber or something like that. And iceberg lettuce is like the worst lettuce. Like that is one thing I'm like vehemently against. It's like it's a it's just a bad lettuce. Like we're not supposed to eat the lettuce. That lettuce. It's just it's not good. Um, but yeah, that was like my experience with vegetables growing up. And then like I got to college and um, I tried Brussels sprouts for the first time. I was like, oh, I love Brussels sprouts. Like they're so good. And there are so many of these vegetables that I had never tried before. And so that was also a part of it too. Is um, I've always been kind of an adventurous eater. I've never really been a picky eater. So I'm, I was excited to try those new things that I had never really, that had never really been part of my experience growing up. It was really, you know, if there was a vegetable, it was probably like a, a sad little salad. <laughs> that was just kind of like, everyone's kind of like, okay, obligatory, but it was mostly like arroz con habichuela, some kind of a meat and tostones, you know, something like that. Yeah. Berenjena. That was probably like the one, the uh, eggplant was probably the one vegetable that we had that we ate consistently growing up and my mom cooked it. It's delicious, but it's like, it's, it's like a deep fried, she would like bread it and deep fry it and then put Parmesan cheese on top of it. And so like at that point in time, it's like, <laughs> this doesn't necessarily feel like super healthy or like, you know, if this is the vegetable component of the meal, that's supposed to be, you know, whatever, but it's funny. Oh, working on my, getting my Mexican style rice with cauliflower rice yes i have just stepped into the cauliflower rice world and it is awesome i love cauliflower rice that's great i will say trader joe's which does not really exist in uptown manhattan very much which that's a side complaint but they do have some they were like my beginner cauliflower rice i just bought the frozen kind mm -hmm. because i was like i'm not gonna bust up some cauliflower to make some rice i'm not gonna rice cauliflower that's crazy so i started with the frozen pack and it was incredible you do have to pay attention but it's the same with white rice it's like you can't walk away from it but so good exactly i totally agree we just got these um, a company on Instagram just sent us the, the, their cauliflower rice. They're like a newer company and they come just in a packet. And so you don't even have to put them in the, oh, they're just done now. They don't have to put them in the fridge or in the freezer or anything. They just kind of come in a packet. And then when you're ready, you can microwave them. Um, and I just, I loved it. I use it all the time. You know, it's, I love that it's bland because you can just add whatever seasoning that you want to it. And so it can, you, it'll just kind of transform with your, um, with your taste. My cousin even made, she does keto. So she uses a lot of those kind of lower carb options. And she did a locrio, which is kind of like a, um, like a meat rice. It's like a <laughs> She's soup not with like rice in it, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So it didn't, she did it, but she did it with cauliflower and, um, it looked really good and her kids ate it and she was like, they didn't even notice that it was cauliflower. So, um, definitely a good option. I am going to, so I want to be able to show you guys what we made. I'm going to just mute myself for a second because, so if you have an Instant Pot, at the very end, you probably know that uh, you can either let it slow release, which means that it naturally comes down and the pressure is let out, which can take anywhere between like 20 minutes to 40 or, or an hour, depending on how much liquid you have in there, or you can do a quick release, which is what I'm gonna do right now, but it's gonna let out a lot of steam and it's kind of loud. So I'm just going to, um, I'll show you the angle as I do it, but I'm going to mute myself so that you don't, uh, it doesn't uh, sound really loud in your I will say you've all convinced me to give this cauliflower rice thing a go because every time I see, I'm worried that this is recorded and all of my faces to you all talking about cauliflower rice are like, I don't think so. Like, I have never seen so many people stand cauliflower rice before. I was just like, wow, y'all are on something that I am not on. Cauliflowers have the ultimate glow up. <laughs> Truly, I was just like, y'all, I mean, listen, I when I see cauliflower rice, I've never seen Latinos talk about cauliflower rice, so I've just ignored it because, you know, I eat rice two to three times a day. So I was just like, if we're not talking about it, I don't believe it. But now my sisters in rice out here are really giving it the five-star Yelp review. Right? 
Yeah, Cecilia, pizza, rice, wings. It used to just be like crusty broccoli that nobody wanted. <laughs> My friend's kid calls it white broccoli. <laughs> I was like, it's just, it is white broccoli. I'm going to need us to pause and reverse on the wings part real quick. We kind of just glided over that. I really don't. Can someone explain that to me? Yeah, cauliflower wings, they're like the the quickest, like quick vegan um, kind of wing replacement. And so you can just, I'll usually, I'll bread them. So I'll, I can, you can double batter them or you can just kind of crust them. Um, cassava flour, yuca flour is really good to, to make some of those crusts or you can make, if you would do like a traditional breading of it with um, the flour and the water and seasoning and all of that. And it's so good. It's obviously, it doesn't taste like a chicken wing, but it gives you that like beautiful, crunchy, sweet, lot of flavor. Again, because cauliflower is so bland, it takes on really whatever flavor you're putting onto it. And so it's just a, it's a nice way to, um, to kind of sub that. So you'll see, I've seen in a lot of restaurants, restaurants that I would never expect, um, buffalo cauliflower wings on the menu. And I'm like, awesome, delicious. Like, thank you. I love this. Um, but yeah, that's a definitely one of the, one of the newer uses for it. Let me, where did my spatula go? So as you probably noticed, we did, I didn't put the cilantro in. Oh shit, almost burned myself. I didn't put the cilantro in because I actually like to, hopefully it'll get on um, steamy. Where did my spatula go? Did you take it? Can you just grab me one really quick, please? With the Instant Pot, I like to finish it with the cilantro. So what I'll do is I'll like give it like a good stir and then, thank you. I'll give it a good stir. You see nice and. I'll give it a good stir and then I'll add in, I'll add in the cilantro and then cover it for like a couple more minutes. And then it's like, that's the perfect amount of flavor. So I'll add like a little bit like this much cilantro in there and then I'll stir it in. And then I'll cover it for like another minute. And that'll be like just enough to to really get the flavor to kind of get in there. And with the instant pot, as you notice, it's not super thick. The the liquid of it is not super thick. It gets a lot thicker as time goes on. So if I'm planning to eat it and serve it and eat it in one day, I'll usually add like a, I'm, if I want it to be like nice and thick, I'll add like a little bit of cornstarch, like just a little bit of cornstarch um, in a little bit of water and I'll add it in to thicken it up on that day. If I know it's something that I, I'm gonna eat over time um, or I'm not gonna eat it all on one day, I like to let it to just let it thicken and kind of do its own thing. And so I'll just leave it um, like that and I'll get nice and thick, like especially the next day, it's perfect. A lot of these dishes, are better the next day, which is something that I really love, especially somebody that eats a lot of leftovers. Um, I love that as the time goes on, the dish kind of transforms, um, which I feel like a lot of dishes in Latinx culture um, are like that. Like the tipile the, the is like, you don't love to eat it the first day, you love to eat it the second, third, fourth day. That's when the juices are really like in the trigo and like all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really like that about um, some of these dishes. Like your hair looks better day two after a wash. I agree. I agree. It, it really is. I love it. Awesome. Any other questions or thoughts? What would you see has been like the hardest, like veggie to like wrap your head around to grasp that you've had the most failed recipes or like, oops, that didn't go that way recipe with? Like what's been the most finicky vegetable? Most finicky vegetable, that's a good question. Let me think. What do you, what would you say? What do, what do you think is the most finicky vegetable? The vegetable we've had the most difficulty with? You want to raise right here? I will say the eggplant. Yeah, the eggplant, that is true. Cause the eggplant, you can mess it up. So a couple of tr uh, tricks with the eggplant that actually even though I taught me, when you're making, and an, a little old Italian lady taught him um, at his work, 
that you salt the eggplant before you cook it because it makes it release a lot of the like um, juice and and uh, sour and bitterness that it has inside of it. So like you got to do a lot of pre-work with the eggplant. And then from there, it's easy to overcook or undercook. And so it can get mushy or um, stay really hard depending on um, what you're doing. And so that can be really challenging. Um, and I would say similar like okra can be challenging at first when you're, I love okra. And um, when you're first cooking with it, it can be really hard because uh, it can get really slimy as um, if you prepare it incorrectly. And so if you like overcook it, it'll get really slimy. And so um, those are some of the more challenging ones. Um, yeah. Is there any, is there a vegetable that you're like, oh, I have no, or, I have no idea or love to know more about? Honestly, my vegetable game is weak. So no, because I haven't actively thought about it, but I need to start actively injecting more into my life. I know that much. So I'm just like, where should I start? Like, I know I like Brussels. I know I like asparagus, but like, what else should I try? And sadly, I'm allergic to eggplant. That's a fun fact. So. Well, then you won't have the trouble <laughs> cooking it. I know when you said eggplant, I was like, oh, can't eat it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. I have a question. When you salt the eggplant, mm -hmm. do you have to, like let it sit for a while? That's a good question. And yes, you do. And you like how it, long? I let it sit for about, um, I would say about like 15 to 20 minutes, but longer is better if you can. Um, the first few minutes it's going to release a lot of the the juice and so that's like really good um a really good uh time so like the first 10 to 15 minutes are really great but if the longer that you can let it go the better um the better it is so here it is i can put it in like a little bowl um i love to serve the chickpea salo with rice um with white rice or brown rice it's just as traditional with the pollo guisado um yeah, and some tostones, that's like my, it would be like a classic pairing, um, some fried plantains and um, the white rice and, and uh, the chickpea salad, I think is, is a classic. Maybe some cauliflower rice. because I'm And gonna... maybe some cauliflower rice, yes. I'm mute. I think I muted myself by accident. Um, I love that you're eating tostones, Amanda. <laughs> I love it. It's like Ivana, that's my daughter's like one of her, her other favorites. Anything fried. She just loves her fried food. I don't blame her. Uh, but yeah, she's like a little tostona bandit. Um, but yeah, let me see if I can. I forgot to bring a bowl over. Ivana, would you mind just grabbing me a bowl really quick so I can just show them what it looks like in a bowl? And it's such a great assistant today. <laughs> this is our first virtual cooking class. So it's been, uh, thank you for being with us. Great. Thank you. All right. As you can see, let me show you over here. The, the chickpeas are like nice and tender. They've opened up. You can see the sauce, how it's developed. And the tomatoes are like, are nice and stewed. And yeah, and it'll get thicker. Like as, as I said, it'll get thicker. It has some body to it, but it'll get thicker as um, time goes on. Um, but again, if you would like it to be thick from the outside, um, you can add in a little bit of uh, cornstarch or a little bit of, um, uh arrowroot right arrowroot powder yeah that's it that's amazing everyone give a shout out to cecilia claps 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 that was thank so you great all. i can't wait to amazing make this this week. thank you thank you all for being the best audience and co-creators ever <laughs> yes Thank you so much once again i just wanted to let everyone know before everyone jumps off that we do have Another event, the homecoming event on October 10th at 5 p.m. I'm sure that you'll get an email about it soon because you guys put all your information after this event. So you'll get all the follow-up events. 
and it's right in the chat too. There's a RSVP link. You can RSVP right now. Um, there's going to be live music, a live band. We're going to have a, a little welcoming address from um, the director of the Latinx Center. And we're going to have some breakout rooms so we can really get to know each other. And we're expecting a big group. So everyone should definitely join. Hey. Thank yeah. you. See you, Thank see you, you next again. time. Yes, everyone snaps again for Cecilia. And I'm so happy that you know you and your family are going to be able to eat that tonight for dinner. Cool. I, that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh, now we have dinner. Even I was actually just put a pot of uh, rice in the stove. So I'll call you yes. rice, unfortunately. But we got our rice cooking up. <laughs> Yay. Right. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. I did not cook a single grain of cauliflower rice today. You coordinated. You you deserve your roses. That bomb intro, I'm not never gonna forget that. I'll be like, that's me. Andrew said. Nobody can say otherwise. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, y'all. Thank you. So good to see you guys.